Good evening and welcome once again to Cornerstone Church Bible Study as we continue looking at this important subject, a very personal subject, of death and eternity. And the last two weeks we've laid the foundation for what we want to say this evening by looking about the origins of death and then looking at the theological defeat of death. How was death defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ. And today we want to look at a subject, it's really an application of the first two messages on dealing with the fear of death. We know the origins of it, we know how it's conquered, but then we must face the practical application of those doctrines in our day-to-day -day lives. And we want to read first from Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, and then we'll turn to Romans chapter 8 and read a few verses from there. But let's read Hebrews 2, 14 and 15 says, For as much as the children, that's us, are partakers of flesh and blood, he, speaking of Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him, that had the power of death, that is, the devil. And deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject or controlled to bondage. And then we want to look at Romans 8, 38 and 39. It's a famous passage of God's word. And Paul says this in summarizing the things that cannot keep us from the love of Christ. He says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let us bow for a word of prayer. Eternal God, our Father in heaven, we thank thee once again that we have the comfort and encouragement of thy precious word when we consider a subject that has so much fear and concern for each of God's children. Bless us as we hear thy voice, speak to us, and Lord, draw us closer to the Lord Jesus Christ as we think about these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, the founding father of the United States, Benjamin Franklin, once made a famous observation. In one of his writings, he said, there are only two things that is really truly certain, he said, death and taxes. Well, people smile at that expression, but only half of it is true, because taxes may never be levied on an individual because you may not live long enough to earn money to pay taxes. But every human born in this world is born to die. And it's the one thing we know about life. The moment we're born, we're going to die. And the Bible puts it in a very blunt way in Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It says, it is appointed. So this is something fixed in God's eternal calendar. It is appointed unto man once to die, but after this, the judgment. Death, therefore, is a very personal subject to each and every one of us, because each and every one of us have to face death. Now, the Bible makes clear that there is this fear of death that has inflicted uh, all of humanity. If you go back to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, the Bible reveals something that you may have picked up in just experience in life, in personal experience or anecdotal experience from watching others, that deep down, fallen man has a fear of death. The Bible explains this. It says in verse 14 of Hebrews chapter 2, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death 
he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. But then he says in verse 15, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the Bible reveals that the fallen man and the fallen woman has a deep sense of foreboding, a dread of fear of death. And most people experience it many times in their lifetime. But everybody experiences, I believe, at least once or twice in their lifetime. Some have called this fear the king of all fears that man has to endure. And the psychologists have even termed a phrase to describe it, thanophobia. And thanatophobia is derived from the Greek god of death, thanatos, and then the Greek word for fear, phobia. So thanatophobia is a term used by psychologists and psychiatrists to counsel those who have such a fear of death that they come looking for medical intervention in their lives. And the fear of death is universal. doesn't matter how rich you are. doesn't matter how educated you are. doesn't matter if you're young or old. doesn't matter what race or culture or background you're from. This fear of death has infected all of humanity. And even professing Christians who are born again can come to a point where they become fearful of death. I reminded you last week that the Lord Jesus Christ, when speaking of death and eternity, said to his disciples in John 14, let not your heart be troubled. The implication of that statement is that some were troubled. Some were afraid. And yet, those of us who know Jesus Christ, those of us who know what happens after we die and have absolute assurance, we should not be afraid. We should be embracing the thought of leaving this world and going to the next world. Now, what are the reasons? We can see the reality of death. Death is not an irrational fear. It's not an unreal fear. It's a real fear that infects many, many lives. It even paralyzes some, uh, that they just don't know what to do. They don't know how to live their lives. But what are the reasons why people fear death? Is it a biochemical problem? Is it a psychological problem? Well, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15, tell us that the fear of death is a spiritual problem. And we're told that the devil exerts a tremendous fear of death over fallen man. It says, the Lord Jesus Christ came to deliver them who through fear of death. So there was a people who were very afraid of death and they had to be delivered. Why were they fear, afraid of death? All their lifetime subject to bondage. They were slaves to this fear, a spiritual fear that the devil brought upon their lives because of sin and temptation and a guilty conscience. Now, this expression that's translated were subject, the, the word subject here has the idea of controlled. And the Greek verb is very interesting. It's what we call the imperfect tense, which has the idea is a continuous fear, continuous cold grip on the soul and the mind of fallen man. And this tells us it's not a momentary, a single moment in time, problem. This is something that lurks beneath the surface, maybe at night time, maybe when you're alone, maybe when you're thinking about the future. And suddenly, as you're planning for this year or next year, suddenly the thought comes, then what happens? I have to face death. Or maybe during this season of pandemic where people are very afraid, uh, very aware of their own mortality and the mortality of those around us, that this fear rears its ugly head 
in our minds, in our souls, and in our hearts. And the Bible tells us, therefore, that the unbelievers, the fallen world, are in a constant state of fear about death and eternity. In fact, they're enslaved by it, controlled by it. It governs their behavior. Many of them, of course, try to forget it by getting consumed in other things, by throwing themselves into business or sport or pleasure or trying to not talk about it, make it a taboo subject so that they don't have to think too much about it. The Bible says this, and it's a very interesting statement in the book of Isaiah, chapter 57, verse 21. The Bible says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. If you're lost, you're not just lost spiritually. You're lost mentally. You're lost about how to live your life right. You're lost as to what to do when you come to the end of life. You're lost as to how to prepare to meet God, how to face eternity. You're lost in all these areas. And it brings a constant state of anxiety and a lack of peace and enjoy in your life. Now, of course, the ultimate reason why people fear death so much is they're not confident as to what happens after they die. They're, they're not confident as to their destination after they die. And deep down, all of us know there's a place, there's a time of accountability after we leave this world. And the devil is able to exert tremendous bondage on our souls and minds because of that. Now, within that general statement, there are many individual reasons why people are afraid of death. And I've listed them in the notes. We fear the loss of control. We like to be in control. But the thought of death is it's a point where we lose control. We, we don't know how to handle what comes next. Uh, we don't know even what comes next. So how can you prepare for something you don't know? We fear dying alone. We fear leaving our loved ones behind and the consequences for them. We fear dying itself, particularly if it involves suffering, disease, pain. We fear the unknown. And death is the ultimate unknown in life. We fear death because we have sinned. We have a guilty conscience, the Bible tells us, that reminds us continually, accusing and excusing us about the sins that we have committed. And of course, we fear standing before God and giving an account of our lives at the great white throne of judgment. The Bible tells us in the book of Ecclesiastes, in chapter 3, we studied it not very long ago, that God hath put eternity in the hearts of every man and every woman. Humans are unique amongst all the other created creatures in that we know we go out to eternity. We know there's life after death. We know there's a place of accountability. So we've seen the reality of the fear of death. We've seen the reasons why people are afraid of death. But if I was to end the message here this evening, it would be a very negative message, wouldn't it? It would be half the gospel. If you go to a doctor for treatment for a particular ailment that you have, and all he does is diagnose the problem and tell you about the reason why you have the particular disease, an ailment. But then he says, oh, that's it. The time's up. The appointment's up. I need to see another patient. You'd be very upset. And you would say, well, aren't you going to tell me how to deal with it? Is there not a remedy, a treatment, an antidote that I can receive that can deal with this problem? And of course, if the doctor is doing his or her job properly and efficiently and effectively, they will not just diagnose the problem and explain the cause of the problem, but they will tell you how you can be cured of the problem, if it's possible. 
to be cured. And the Bible doesn't leave us hanging here. It tells us there is a remedy to deal with the fear of death. And it's found just in the same passage that we read that diagnosed the problem and explained that the fear of death was real and not imaginary. In Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. In fact, it begins really with the remedy before it goes on to discuss the reasons and the reality of the fear of death. Because it says, for as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood. So it says, just like for as much, just like you and I are made of human flesh and blood. So it says, he also himself likewise. So the Lord Jesus Christ likewise took on flesh and blood like you and I have. Why did he do it? That through death, through his death, he, that's Jesus Christ, might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil. So the Lord Jesus Christ is the secret. Well, maybe I shouldn't even call it the secret because it's in black and white. It's, it's, it's openly stated here. He is the key to dealing with the fear of death. It's through him that he might destroy him that had the power of death. And then it goes on in verse 4, 15, and deliver. So Christ not only defeated death for us, but he delivered us from the fear of death and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. So the gospel message is the remedy to deal with not just the penalty of sin, the power of sin, it does all those things, but it goes much further. The death and resurrection of Jesus Christ brought a situation about that he delivered us from the fear even of death. Not just the feeling of death, not just the power of death, but it says he came to deliver us from the fear of death. So how does he do that? Well, of course, the first thing he does when he delivers us from the fear of death is that he gives us the assurance that we have eternal life, that death doesn't have the final word on our lives, that it's just merely a transition from this part of this world into the new world of eternity, from life into eternity. And it comes about simply by faith in the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why he said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Now, what other ways, apart from just simply believing on the person of Christ, to take away the power of sin and the penalty of sin and to enable you to overcome the fear of death. What other ways does he help us deal with the fear of death? Well, the Bible tells us that one of the ways he helps us is to be with us as we walk through the valley of the shadow of death. Remember what the psalmist said in Psalm 23. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Why? Because I'm a positive thinker? Because I, I just ignore the thought of death? No, the psalmist explains. I will fear no evil. Why? For thou art with me. He who promised, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, in Hebrews 13 and 5, will never leave us, will never forsake us. He'll be with us every step of the journey of life, even as we go through the valley of the shadow of death. That brings comfort. That removes the sting and the fear of death for the child of God. In Matthew 28, verse 20, he repeats. He says, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. No matter how difficult it may be, no matter how uh, painful, and hard may be the road that you have to walk through in your last days and last hours, he says, I'll be with you. I'll help you get through it. I'll not leave you. I'll not run away. One of the things, you know, that brings comfort to people uh, as they die and as in, they're in their last days often is the presence of others, especially those that they love and are near and dear to them. 
and they loved to be, have them gathered around the bedside and to talk to them and uh, communicate with them, and listen to them. Even if they themselves can't speak very much, they like to have the presence of others. Well, the greatest person to have with you at death is the Lord Jesus Christ. And unlike others who have to go home, maybe if you're in a hospital, they have to leave at the end of visiting time, he'll always be with you. He'll always be beside you. He will always be willing to help you and to comfort you as you go through the valley of the shadow of death. And that is why so many of God's children have been able to face death without any fears. The old Methodists used to die so well that John Wesley would tell people, our people die well. They die in comfort. They die in hope. They die with joy. I quoted recently old Simeon. After he met the Lord Jesus Christ in the temple, he said these words in Luke's Gospel, chapter 2, verse 29. Lord, now lettest thou thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. He says, I've seen the Messiah. I've seen the Savior. I've seen the one who will take the penalty and power of sin. And seeing him has taken away all fear of death for old Simon. And he said, let me now go in peace. Take, take me home to glory. The Apostle Paul put it in this way in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 8. He says, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and present with the Lord. He says in Philippians 1.21, to die is gain. And that term is a monetary term, a term that speaks about profit. And Paul says, we, we gain a profit. We gain something greater than what we have by simply going through death. And why did Paul make such a statement? Because he knew that in dying... His body went to the cemetery, but his soul went to the sanctuary of glory forevermore. Old John Newton, who wrote that famous old hymn, Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. When he got old, Newton's health failed him, and his voice became very weak. Physically, he wasn't able to leave the house to go and preach in the church that he pastored and he had to just simply lie in bed as many old folk do in their last days one of a, a friend of John Newton came to see him in his last hours and as he talked to Newton Newton with a very weak voice said these words to him he said I am like a person going on a journey in a stagecoach and he says, who expects its arrival every hour and is frequently looking out of the window for it. I am packed and sealed and ready for the post. In other words, he says, I'm like a person just looking out of the window, waiting for my transport, my taxi, to take me to my destination. And I know it's coming any moment, John Newton says. And I, I, I'm like an impatient person. I'm looking out the window and say, is it here yet? Is it here? And he says, my bag's packed. I'm ready to go. No delays. As soon as it comes, I'm gone. And there's no hesitation, no doubt in my mind. And Newton knew that death is merely a path that we all must walk but it is the path to meeting our greatest friend at the end of the path, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, we are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be what? Present with the Lord. Now, having said all of what I've said this evening, I'm sure there are people listening and they're saying, that's all very good. Uh, and I don't disagree with anything you've said in theory from the Word of God. But practically, how do I, as an individual living in my home, in the circumstances that I find myself, 
how do I prepare myself to face death and to deal with the fears of death? Well, let me give you just a number of things, and it's not an exhaustive list. First of all, take time each day to strengthen your faith by the word of God. The Bible says this, faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God in Romans chapter 10, verse 17. In other words, the word of God, the more you take in of it, the more your faith will be strengthened by it. As you read the narratives, as you read the great prayers and doctrinal statements and prophecies of the Bible, all of these things feed your faith and not your fears. Dampen your fears and feed your faith. And God tells us, take time to take in the word of God. And the more we know of God, the more we know of God from his word, the more we gain assurance of our faith, the more our faith is strengthened, the more it becomes certain in our hearts about our future. John says in 1 John five thirteen, these things have I written unto you who believe on the name of the Son of God that ye may know that ye have eternal life. The more you know about God's word, the more assured you are of your eternal destination. Study carefully the word of God. In particular, here's another practical thing you can do. Study carefully the passages that deal with heaven, that deal with the assurance of salvation. Remind yourself of the promises of God's word with you every moment of every day. Meditate upon them. Pray over them. Pray at the throne of grace and plead the promises of God. That'll help remove the fears and the doubts that you have. Sing the hymns. There's some wonderful hymns of assurance. There's some wonderful hymns about heaven. When we all get to heaven, what a wonderful day that will be. When the trumpet of the Lord shall sound and time shall be no more. And the roll is called up yonder. I'll be there. Sing hymns like that. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our griefs and to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. You know, that's the remedy, practically. Those are the remedies that you can practically draw from to encourage yourself. Here's another one. Be fearful at the, at the gathering of God's people at the place of prayer where God's people gather to pray. And as you do that, your soul will be uplifted. Your fears will be dampened and your faith will be strengthened as you listen to them pray, as you're encouraged by their words and by their encouragement to you and their presence. Participate in the sacraments, particularly of the Lord's table. And as you do so, the Bible says you will be strengthened. It will minister grace to you. It's a means of grace to strengthen your soul and your mind and your heart about the greatness of Christ and the greatness of eternity to come and his presence with you every step of the way. Now, I know, having said all of that, that there will still be moments where Satan will come and try to make you doubt. And even some of the greatest choicest of God's saints were afraid at times in their lives of death. John Knox, the great Scottish reformer who Queen Mary, Queen of Scots said, I fear the prayers of John Knox more than mighty armies. John Knox would thunder throughout Scotland powerful messages, powerful sermons that people would quake in their seats as they listened to him preach. And yet, when he got old, John Knox, there were times when he became afraid, afraid of eternity, afraid of death, and afraid of dying. And his wife, who was a little bit younger than him, significantly younger than him, Knox would ask her, 
to come and sit beside him as he lay in bed, as he faced eternity. And he would say to her, can you read to me the word of God? And in particular, he would say, read to me from John 17, where I first cast my anchor of salvation when I was saved by the grace of God. And she would take up John 17 and read it to the dying reformer. And as she read it, he would sigh and say, that's where I I first cast my anchor. That's where I found the grace of God. And he found peace and comfort and assurance of his faith through the word of God. The early Christians, and this may seem very strange to us, when a believer died, according to the early church fathers, they would often celebrate the death of that person as the person's birthday. You say, well, why would they do that? And every year on the anniversary of the death of a dearly beloved saint who had passed on to heaven, they would celebrate and remember it as that saint's birthday. And they would argue this way. They say, it's the birthday of that saint's promotion to heaven, into glory. Jesus Christ came to set us free from the fear of death. And Christians should not, should not be afraid of death. Death is not the end of the road. It's just a bend on the road that brings us from life into eternity. And the thing to understand about entering heaven is simply this. You have to leave something in order to gain something. You have to put off something in order to put on something. You have to put off mortality to receive immortality. You have to put off this corruptible body in order to receive an incorruptible body. And death is a trade-in. It's a trade-in. It's the moment where we trade in this fallen, frail, decaying mortal body and we simply receive the new, incorruptible, immortal body like unto the Lord Jesus Christ. Alexander McLaren, the great Scottish preacher, was once asked, what happens to the believer at death? And he listed three things. And listen to them very carefully, and they're very helpful. He said, the first thing that happens at death is we lose everything we don't need. Isn't that right? We lose the world, the flesh, the devil. We lose our trials, our troubles, our temptations our fears and our weaknesses. But then he said the second thing that happens to us, we keep everything that really matters. We keep our personality, our identity, and our knowledge of all that is good. And then he said the third thing that happens is this. We gain what we never had before. We lose everything we don't need, We keep everything that matters, and then we gain everything we never had before. We gain heaven, we gain the presence of the saints of God in glory, the angels, and of course, most of all, we gain the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're in the presence of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords for all of eternity. Our days are numbered. Let me wrap this up by saying this. Our days are numbered from the moment we are born. And the world sees death as a loss. And frankly speaking, for them it is a loss. But for the child of God, the Christian can declare as he or she faces death, for me to live is Christ. In other words, to live life on earth The greatest life to live is the life of Christ. For me to live is Christ. But to die is gain. Now the unbeliever can't say that. Their life is for themselves. For me to live is 
to satisfy myself, to live for myself. And to die is a loss. They have a different verse in their Bible that guides them. But the Christian has this verse stated by the Apostle Paul, which really is a motto verse for the Christian life. For me to live is for Christ, is the life of Christ. But to die, Paul says in Philippians 1.21, is gain, is truly gain. And those who truly live for Christ, then death is always a gain. Death is always beneficial. Death is always something to look forward to. And you and I will have to face death. The Bible makes that so clear. But we'll either face it with fear or with faith. Paul tells us, writing to Timothy, that God does not want us to face death with fear, but with faith. Listen to what he said in 2 Timothy 1.7. He said, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what God wants to do. He, he wants to remove the fear of death from you. He doesn't want you to fear it. If you find yourself this evening, as a child of God, afraid of death, then I simply say this to you. Get back to the Bible. Start immersing your soul and your mind in the promises of God. And the more you do, the more your faith will be strengthened and the more your fears will be dampened and limited in your life. Those who are prepared to die are able to live. Now that seems a strange thing to say, but it's so true. Those who are ready to die are only those who are truly ready to live life here on earth because once you have solved that issue, faced that issue, and really worked out that issue, then you can truly live life here on earth. I trust you've done that. I trust you are ready to meet God. I trust that you are confident of your eternal destination. And if you're not, if you're not, you need to get ready. Old Amos put it so well when he said, prepare to meet thy God. Get ready. Because one day, very soon, and it may come sooner than you anticipate or plan, and others anticipate or plan for you, it may come much sooner and arrive much sooner than you expect. We're going to finish this evening by listening to a hymn, a beautiful hymn, that I heard just a few days ago at the funeral of a lady who I knew from my childhood days. She passed away when she was almost 92 years of age. She had a large family and a husband and her ran a business together, a very successful business. They came from poverty but by the grace of God, they were able to do very well in life. And their children did well in life and were brought up in the fear and admonition of the Lord. And one of her favorite hymns was this hymn, and she had it played in her house constantly. I will sing the wondrous story of the Christ who died for me. And as I listened to it played at her funeral, I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful for us to finish this evening by listening to it? And as you listen to the words, get comfort from them. Let it strengthen your faith that you can sing about Christ, your Redeemer. Before we listen to it, let me just thank you for listening. Wherever you are in the world, and if you would like to join us this Sunday at Suntech City, if you're in Singapore, our services are at 10 a.m. and at 11.30. If you wish to join with us, please register 
at the church Facebook page or through the church website on the online registration form so that we can make sure that your details are there and the seat is reserved for you because of the limitation there still is in respect of numbers. Let's listen now to this closing hymn, I Will Sing the Wonder Story. God bless you and keep you throughout the week. Thank you.